Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on the topic of holistic tips to healthy eating and exercise. My name is Ann Lee Gilbert, and I'm the Senior Specialist of Programs and Online Education for Candy Multiple Sclerosis, and I look forward to being your moderator this evening. For those of you who might not be familiar with who we are, CanDo MS is a provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS. And through our programs, we help to empower people to manage their disease and to move beyond their MS by adopting active and healthy lifestyle behaviors. And you can learn about the different programs that we provide to you and your support partner by visiting our website at www.mscando.org backslash programs. And here on the screen, you can see all of the programs that we provide. You can learn about our four-day flagship program called the Can Do Program that's held once a year. We have our one-day jumpstart program that we bring to different parts of the country about five times a year. And then we also have our two-day Take Charge program. Um, and then, of course, you have our webinar series that you're on right now. And you can also uh, view our archived webinars that are recorded and also housed on our website. So please uh, feel free to visit our website to learn about all these programs. And you can also connect with us on social media. Uh, we're on Facebook. Find us on Facebook, like us, and you can find all kinds of up-to-date information regarding our upcoming programs as well as events. Connect with us on Twitter and receive the most up-to-date tweets about what's happening with our organization. And you can also find us on YouTube. Um, you can browse our channel for some fun webinar recordings that we have as well as some fun videos that staff has made. So feel free to look for us on social media. And before, um, before I get into uh, introducing our presenters, there are a few housekeeping issues I'd like to go over. We will save about the last 10 to 15 minutes of this presentation for your questions and answers. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and so everyone's phone lines are muted. But you can ask your question through posting them in the chat feature on the bottom left-hand uh, side of your screen. So. Um, in the chat box, you can type in your question, hit send, and we'll be able to view your questions and we'll save them for the end of the webinar to try and answer. Uh, and again, this web, uh, webinar is being recorded and it'll be archived on our website for you to review again tomorrow. And now to our presenters. Uh, here on your screen, you'll see Ms. Eliza Ben Zachariah, and uh, she is a board certified nurse practitioner at the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis at Mount Sinai Medical Center. She earned her BSN degree from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel, her MSN from Hunter College, Bellevue School of Nursing, and her NP certificate from Columbia University. In 2010, she earned her doctorate in nursing practice from Case Western Reserve University with a focus in education. Among the first group of nurses to be certified in multiple sclerosis nursing, she provides direct patient care, follow-up, and training for patients and their families, and performs clinical trials. She has published chapters and articles about different topics, including MS genetics, MS overview, DMAs, symptom management, and uh, palliative care in MS. She's on the advisory board of MS Perspectives, a quarterly magazine for patients with MS and their families, and is the chair of the International Organization of Multiple Sclerosis Nurses website committee. Welcome, Eliza. And here you see Amy Dix. Amy Dix has been working, uh, working, the, working in the field of multiple sclerosis since 2006. She has been a physician assistant since 2004, began her career in asthma and allergy and immunology. She obtained her Physician Assistant Certification at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, and Master's Degree in Physician Assistant Studies with an emphasis in Neurology from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in 2009. She obtained her MS Clinical Specialty certific Certification in 2011. Amy is new to the CanDo MS team as a Physician Assistant in MS and offers diverse talent scope of gait rehab, nutrition, and yoga. As a Kansas City native, Amy has established a small MS center in her hometown known as the KCMS Center. KCMS Center is recognized by the Consortium of MS Centers. Amy collaborated with the members of her multi-specialty care team at College Park Specialty Center in Greater KC Metro Area to provide an infusion center, Baclofen Pump Team, Bionis Gait Evaluation, Botox Research, MS Physical Therapy, and MS Support Group. Her passion is in yoga and with a partnership of and with a partnership of Liz Franklin and MS Heartland Border Walk, she established Sit Down and Feel Better, a program of chair yoga for people with MS created by Liz Franklin. Currently, Casey has a five-day 
per week free yoga classes accessible to MS patients and their families. Presently, she is working towards obtaining her cert certified clinical nutrition certification through the Clinical Nutrition Certification Board. All right, so now I'm, I'm very excited to welcome both uh, Elisa and Amy, and, and I'd like to now uh, give the controls to Elisa. Thank you so much, Anne. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Anne mentioned, my name is Elisa, and I'm working in a, an MS center in New York City. And in addition, I'm a recent graduate of Columbia University uh, in a program of uh, master's in nutrition. So it has been my passion, passion all, all along in the last 14 years that I'm taking care of patients with MS and before that. Uh, I think both Amy and I believe that nutrition, diet, and exercise are pretty much the cornerstones of our existence with a few probably other things like love and social support and air and many, many other things. So uh, as, as you heard, the topic here is holistic tips to healthy eating and exercise. And I would like to uh, start by closing a few questions. That many of our patients really ask often, is there any association between diet and multiple sclerosis? Is a high uh, BMI associated with, with MS? Are there anything that our patients can do to control the disease uh, progression? Uh, anything that we can do to improve our health? Um, I think there, there are really, really many questions that come to mind. The, uh, the main question, though, is what really is a healthy diet for all of us and for MS in particular? You hear a lot of these names of different diets, the swank diet, dairy food, a vegetarian diet, paleo diet, Mediterranean diet. And I can tell you stories that many of my patients try so, so many, many diets that's out there. I think the problem is that there are so many conflicting claims about what constitutes a healthy diet, and no wonder that we are confused, our patients are confused, and even uh, Lisa uh, Simpson is confused. So we'll try in this next uh, hour or so to really talk about healthy tips, exercise programs that really, really improve our health overall. Next, really, it's always important to make the right choice and, and how we make those healthy decisions based on what we know, based on what we hear uh, from our patients, from other networks, and from professionals. Important to, to uh, listen to professionals, uh, listen to those people that have experience in nutrition, uh, dietitian. Uh, really important to take those uh, important data out that's out there. But there's so many, again, as I mentioned, so many misconceptions and conflicting claims. But the general, really, uh, idea is to think about what you really put in your mouth. Uh, think about to make those daily, daily uh, healthy decisions include nutrient-dense products like uh, vegetables, like whole grain. Uh, have a colorful life with colorful vegetables and fruits and, and whole grain and lean meat. And we'll talk about each one of them separately in more, in more details. Remember that food is really a drug mm -hmm. if you think about it. And your body is really like a chemistry lab if you can picture it. So everything you, you eat causes a reaction, almost like a chain reaction in your body. And what you eat and how much you eat determines that reaction. So really important to think about quality and quantity, the two cues. And be particular, but don't be too crazy and don't be too obsessive or compulsive about what to eat. Make reasonable choices. And I can tell you now, it's okay to cheat. It's okay to go out of line once in a while. But just important in general to make those healthy decisions. So think positively and think about uh, health gain, not only about weight loss. I will give you a few recommendations as we go along, uh, something to include on a daily basis, something to include in a week and a month. But really, every day really is, is spent by itself when you think about nutrition. So one of the recommendations that is forever, ever there is to eat at least five portions of 
fruit and vegetable every day. More vegetables than fruit because of the sugar content. And we'll, we'll talk about the plate later on. But to include green leafy vegetables, fresh fruits, all food, uh, avoid those saturated fats that found in animal fats. However, there are some positive points to the lean parts of meat that we'll talk. Avoid trans fats. And what are these trans fats? I think humans always try to manipulate these substances we have out there. So many, many years ago, uh, human decided to add some uh, another molecule, another hydrogen to fat to make them uh, last longer, not to get wasted, not to lose their quality. However, what we've discovered that by that manipulation and change that we have done, and we cause it to call trans fat because of the combination there, it increases the, the risk, for example, of cardiovascular disease. So nowadays, you almost see on every package uh, to avoid trans fat. Avoid too much sodium. There is a few studies lately that talk about high sodium intake and, and MS issues. Uh, not too much cholesterol uh, containing food, and definitely to minimize and limit added sugar like pastry and pies. So there are some general rules that I think you probably most of you know and, and, and important to follow most, most of the time. Uh, one other thing that really relates to all this is hydration and, and fluid intakes. And I think uh, many of us get busy throughout the day and don't drink enough, especially patients that have bowel issues or blood issues. It's really important to hydrate yourself. And when I say hydration, I mean water. And it's 8 to 10 cups uh, each day. Um, don't forget to really take that cup of water in between what you do throughout the day. And some of us have <clears throat> difficulty to drink water. So you can drink the water, but also think about other ways to, to take in that ingre these ingredients. For example, like smoothie. Uh, smoothie has a, a, a definitely a high quality ingredient because you really, when you do the smoothie, you include the, the skin, you don't peel it. So you really include the pulps and everything of the fruits and the vegetables. So it doesn't lose the vitamins and minerals um, and antioxidants and the fiber. So it's a one uh, great way to add to your day, to add more fluids to your day and more uh, quality. Um, so now uh, Amy will uh, describe a few recipes of delicious smoothie uh, and shakes that really can color your day and add more to it. Amy? Yeah, thank you. Let me just advance here and see if we can um, get to the next slide. Not sure I have controls again. Uh, okay. Awesome. There we go. So here are a few different ideas. Let's continue the chemistry lab idea. We have lots of different ways that uh, smoothies are available to us. My mom is interested in the Nutribullet. Her idea is that it's quick and easy and uh, something she can take on the go with just one small container. My favorite is the Vitamix because you can make a smoothie from um, vegetables to fruit um, or juice if you'd like to, or then there's a standard blender as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, there are lots of advantages and disadvantages of each of the blenders, and I think that traditional blenders sometimes can get a little sticky and difficult, but they're great to just give smoothies a try. And I agree with Aliza, it's a nice way to add fluid to your day. It sometimes is hard to get that two liters to three liters of water in, uh, which really helps with a lot of the side effects of MS. Um, but we can include some of the fiber and um, nutrients and um, juice from the, the whole fruits in a smoothie and, and get a little liquid as well. So moving forward, healthy smoothie ideas. So unless you're using the Vitamix, it's a good idea to put the liquid in first. Um, if you're using the Vitamix, you'll want to put the powders in first. You'll start slow, and if your blender has speed, start on the low speed first to break up the larger pieces of fruit, the frozen fruit or, you know, even the larger vegetables if you wanted to include vegetables. Um, you can add a little bit of water or even coconut water or coconut milk or whatever liquid you like. Um, to begin the puree, and blenders with function buttons and pulsing can sometimes help. Um, I have a, a stick inside of my Vitamix that helps move it around. 
An example of a berry smoothie recipe, this is one of my favorites. It's another way to continue the chemistry in our kitchen. One banana, uh, one, to cup, one to two cups of frozen berries, a little bit of coconut, hemp, or rice milk to prevent constipation. Um, so water to decrease thickness if you need to. And you can add a half a cup at a time. Um, sometimes I add a little bit of coconut oil, maybe some chia seeds and flax seeds. Uh, other people enjoy raw honey in their smoothies to make it a little sweet without adding um, too much sugar, as Aliza suggested. Um, sometimes if you don't have access to green vegetables, I know it's wintertime here in Kansas, just like it is probably on the East Coast for Aliza, um, sometimes freeze-dried greens are helpful um, options. And then adding ice can help thicken it. So can sometimes nuts, like cashews, if you want more of a, an ice cream flavor without having that dairy or extra ice, you can add cashews or avocado to make it a little bit more smooth um, and thick. And in the next slide, there's a lot of other fun ingredients that sometimes I suggest to patients to give a try. So there's the chia seeds up on the right. Yes, they do come from the chia pet, but they're a lot of fun, and there's a lot of literature on how they help us stay hydrated. So they're dates that can help sweeten um, a smoothie that might have a little bit more of a vegetable um, base. Uh, there's coconut milk down below coming from the coconut and coconut oil, um, flaxseeds up on the upper left as well as flaxseed oil. And just like Aliza had suggested, flaxseed oil you want to stir in instead of um, processing with the blender because otherwise you hydrogenate it, just like she was saying. Um, and then moving forward, We'll talk a little bit about healthy eating. Back to you. Great, great tips, Mimi. So you can see, I mean, if it's difficult to get water, you can get all these uh, great um, ingredients into a smoothie and have a, a one big glass of healthy, healthy uh, smoothie and healthy shake. So a few more uh, recommendations about healthy eating. Uh, we always talk about calcium-rich fat foods and, and vitamin D. Um, we hear a lot of, about evidence that there is some association between vitamin D and, and multiple sclerosis. It's an association. We don't know exactly that it's cause and effect, but we check, and if there is a deficiency, we, we actually uh, supplement. But important to really eat foods that reach of vitamin D or fortify vitamin D better than supplementation like milk, like salmon, like mackerel and sardine, uh, cod liver oil. The natural uh, way when you take it via food, you get the active ingredients, supplements, and also when you get it, you get a mixture of vitamins, a mixture of ingredients. When you get the supplements, uh, not only you don't know really what you're getting, sometimes it's you get one, one thing out of the whole thing, just the vitamin D and nothing else with it. So important to really think about food as supplements in your calcium and vitamin D. You want to be sometimes careful about calcium if you are prone to develop a renal stone. So keep it in mind. Uh, use low-fat low dairy products such as low-fat yogurt, yogurt and low-fat milk. Um, definitely try to choose most of the time, lean cuts of meat, chicken, and fish. Fish is a great uh, source of omega-3, for example, as, as Amy mentioned earlier, the flux is oil, too. So important to include those. And then protein um, can be supplemented with beans and nuts, which, again, a natural way to, uh, to supplement your uh, deficiencies. It's almost if you think about the cycle that calcium has to be um, absorbed. You have to have enough vitamin D to absorb uh, calcium, and then to have absorption of vitamin D, you need some fat. So as you can see, anything, everything in our diet is, is positive. It's not that you should not have fat and should not have sugar. They all come in combination, and it's more about the quality and the quantity. So one of the important terms that came from the U.S. Department of Agriculture is the my plate, my plate concept. It's the color of your plate, and you can see the different colors of protein, grains, vegetables, fruits, and dairy. And if you look at the plate, uh, you can see that half of the plate is fruits, fruits and vegetables. Vegetable would be 
bigger than fruits because of, as I said, uh, because of sugar content. And then you have a quarter of the plate protein, uh, a quarter is grain, and then you have on the side uh, a small portion of dairy. This is important to look at. It's a visual thing that you can see how much content because sometimes we think about quantity, and I think everyone has different concepts about quantity, and I will show you some picture of portion control, which are also really important. But remember that half of your plate has to include uh, vegetable and food. So let's talk about more in details now. Let's talk about foods. Um, so foods are not all the same. There are some foods that have a, a high glycemic index and some food have high glycemic. So what is glycemic index? Uh, what it means is that your blood sugar uh, go high when you eat carbohydrates, different types, sugars and starches when you eat them. And once your sugar in the blood goes up, you, you have more insulin released by the pancreas. So the more insulin you have, the more sugar, and it's digested, turn it into, you use it for energy, of course, the sugar, and some of it gets stored in the liver. The more you have, though, over time, it can cause some problems, so can lead sometimes to diabetes, but the concept of mixture is really important. One of the examples for, for, uh, of a uh, very high glycemic index is white bread or watermelon. It's not that you cannot have them. Some nutritionists don't really pay attention so much to glycemic index. However, it's important more so if you have diabetes. diabetes. But, again, keep combination of fruits and vegetables. Um, oranges are known to have eyes, and it's not so, so high. It's much less than, than watermelon, by the way. So it's just, again, the mixture of colors and all fruits and all vegetables uh, is critical on a day-to-day -day decision. Uh, as I mentioned, should have twice as many vegetables than fruits and, and because of the uh, sugar content. If we talk about sugar, we ought to speak about also sugar and, and refined sugar. Uh, those sugar that have like simple combination like just fructose uh, and not too many different uh, combinations that you see in Cokes and soft drinks that sometimes can do not really have enough benefits and do not have all this context of vitamins and, and, um, and minerals. So important to think the type of sugars that you, you take in. Refined sugar is those cakes and donuts and all the good stuff that sometimes we, uh, we uh, don't really need necessarily. Um, the one, one thing that I, when I did my research, I found that dark chocolate, for example, have a lot, uh, a lot of uh, mineral, have some potassium in it, have some fibers in it, and, and there's some good, good, good combination of things. So not all chocolate is bad for you. It's good for the mood as well. So uh, next, on uh, next slide, uh, I'm really showing you an illustration of all food, partial all food, and not. So what is whole food? You can see it illustrated with the whole food, the whole orange. It's really, it is what you eat. It's the, it's the fruit itself. And then the second part, the partial whole food, it's when you make the juicing, that you with a, an orange, so you know it came out from an orange. So that's why when you do juicing, you lose a bit of the vitamin because it's more the juice inside and it's not the skin of the either apple or the orange and, and, and the, the whitish surrounding of the orange. But you get some value to it. There is some vitamin to it in it as well. And that's the not at all, you see the, the bottle, it's not at all whole food products because it's something from a store, you really do not know what the ingredients. It can be water and a bit of, of color of, of, uh, of orange to make it a juice, look like a juice. So you can see the steps here. So very, very um, reasonable and important to include mainly whole food throughout your day. So, so now, now we're going <laughs> go so to talk a little bit about juicing and how to get that um, skin in the juice if we can, maybe still removing the fiber, um, and a couple of different ways to get that uh, juicing in with vegetables is either a cold press or a masticating juicer or a centrifuge-related juicer. The centrifuge juicer on the bottom is much more common 
sometimes, you know, places like Whole Foods or Cafe Gratitude or raw food restaurants will have a masticating juicer. You can get one at home if you'd like, but it doesn't heat up the um, – the produce, so we don't lose as many vitamins that way. And some say that it may, the juice may last a little longer than the centrifuge juicer. So a couple of examples. Uh, this morning I had, um, I was able to stop by Whole Foods and they will make me a juice on my way to work. And in that juice I had two green apples. I take out the seeds but leave the skins on. There are four stalks of celery, cucumber, we leave the skin on when they juice. Uh, six leaves of kale, one and a half to one lemon, peeled or not peeled. It depends on how you like your juice. And then about an inch or so of ginger. And I had a delightful way to start my day with those healthy greens. Again, it doesn't have fiber, but it's a great way to get micronutrients in, um, of those small little um, nutrients that are helpful throughout the day. So here's another example. So for green juicing, it's great for micronutrients. It's a great way to get some servings of veggies, although it is minus the fiber, with less cook time and preparation. And the nice thing about juicing the raw vegetable is that when you cook food, you lose some of the vitamins and nutrients. And so this is a great way to get the raw food with as many nutrients and, and vitamins in the actual food itself. A lot of time with soil depletion and other things happening in the way food is being grown, we don't get as many nutrients as we did 100 years ago. So eating it in the raw form might be, might be an option for you. I think like we talked about earlier with Elise's presentation, how important it is to get in all of that great um, hydration throughout the day. Juicing, specifically greens, can help with constipation um, as well as some of the side effects or symptoms of MS um, by hydrating us. On the very bottom of my screen, you can see an example of what it might look like to juice with a Vitamix or one of the other higher power blenders. What they're using is a paint strainer from Home Depot or Lowe's. It's pretty simple. In fact, um, I have them outside in my garage. I wash them first, and then we pour the blended material from the Vitamix or the juicer through that paint strainer, and you can reuse it time and time again until it wears out. Otherwise, uh, the centrifugal juicer or the, the hydropress like we saw before are great options for juicing. I also like the example of the mason jars in the bottom. Mason jars are pretty simple, and they say, you know, we talked about getting fluids in. If you can get, you know, two of those larger, nearly liter mason jars of juice in a day, you're doing pretty well with regards to your hydration. So I think now we're going to move forward and talk a little bit about portion control with Aliza. So let's talk about quantity. If you can look at the slides, I think it speaks in thousands of words. You compare vegetables and fruits to nuts. You can see the small amounts of nuts, 50 gram and 26 gram on the top and bottom. And look at the fruit, uh, I believe it's some cantaloupe, uh, 420 gram, and the celery down green, it's 920 gram. So definitely provide you a similar amount of calories and actually what, uh, and, and what is the big difference in quantity. However, all important nuts is also a source for protein as well as vegetable and fruits uh, uh, for, for fibers and many other vitamins. So let's talk a bit more about uh, vegetables. Um, as, as Amy just mentioned, the green vegetable or green mixture gives you high fiber, and that's why they're really important for regulation of bowel routine, bowel management, and constipation. You have two types of vegetables, those starchy vegetables and non-starchy vegetables. Both of them, both of these vegetables are an important part of your diet. They offer plenty of fiber, of vitamins, and minerals, and they're relatively low in calories. See, the major difference between starchy and non-starchy vegetables is that starchy veggies have a higher starch content and that's why they also higher a bit in calories. But they're both important, as I mentioned. So some, uh, some examples for starchy vegetables, corn, potatoes, that you should use sparingly, but okay to include in your diet. And the non-starching vegetable is all those leafy greens, broccoli, cabbage, and then also including garlic, onion. And there is some data that it's lower risk of heart disease and high blood pressure and protect against many other diseases. Uh, let's look next. 
this is just an illustration, a picture, I think, for all you of you high-tech people. You can look at the mouse piece here and look at the portion control. This is the size of potato that really is allowed or allowed. I mean, you can always go outside of the rules here. But this is a usual recommendation. Next is talking about protein. Protein is a very important source of energy and building block and many of the amino acids that we, we require for tissue repair, for muscle uh, repair, for energy. Uh, those amino acids are called essential amino acids. In, what does it mean essential? We have to get them to the food, uh, those like omega-3 and omega-6. So these, these amino acids are there about nine or 10 of them that provide you that building blocks. Uh, important to include lean meats, lean cuts, I mentioned wild fish like salmon. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, high source of uh, omega-3. People that are vegetarian need to think about other combinations to provide them with these essential uh, amino acids like uh, nuts, uh, sunflower seeds, flaxseed oil that Amy mentioned earlier. So really, really important to include those. Let me go next. This is showing you a, a size of a, a chicken piece. The, the, the same goes for a fish and steak. If you remember your time in a restaurant and you get a huge, huge, huge amount of, of uh, meat that's really uh, high in calorie and also high in saturated fat. So think about that. When you compare fish, for example, to, to meat, definitely the fish has much less saturated fat uh, in content. Whole grain. So let's talk about whole grain and refined grain. Uh, you really want to include those uh, uh, those dense grains uh, daily, uh, pretty much. Some of them uh, are complex versus simple carbohydrates, and we talked about sugar earlier. So those uh, those carbohydrates often we sell as carbs, of course, are your primary energy source, and some of them are called uh, bad, nicknamed bad, the simple one or complex, as I mentioned earlier, on there, and that's based. Uh, based on the chemical makeup and what your body does with them, really. The complex carbohydrates like whole grain and legume, contain, they contain more of a longer chain of sugar, and that's why they require more time to break down and digest and go into your system. The simple ones are much easier, and they are mainly used for energy uh, without the other really uh, value. Um, most of the grain that we know made from wheat, rice, cornmeal and barley. The two groups, as I mentioned, the whole grain is the whole wheat flour, all wheat pasta, the brown rice, uh, oatmeal. Those give you a lot more fiber, iron, vitamins, especially vitamin Bs. And those refined grains include more of the processed um, uh, grains uh, like white bread, white rice, uh, have a bit less of vitamins. So if you can include those whole grains, it's probably better quality. This is just showing you, I think we all love pasta, and we eat a lot of pasta, correct? It's easy to make, uh, but look at the, uh, at the portion amount that's really, really considered healthy for a day. I love the figure with the hand because I think our hands always go with us. Correct? All, wherever we go, we don't need a measuring cup really here. So you can see the whole hand is for bread, for slices of bread. Then if you look at the palm, just the round middle area, it's for any meat, lean cut of meat again, uh, fish um, uh, piece and, and chicken. And then when you look at the fist, that's for our veggie, for rice, for pasta, for fruits. But remember, you need five of fruits and vegetables throughout the day. And then the fingertips is just for the oil uh, quantity. So it's a, good, it's a good rule of thumb to walk with your hands all around. Um, so dairy. I think there is so much confusing data about dairy. I always say it's not good for you, it's good for you. Uh, there is very limited data about the relationship between dairy and MS. Uh, it's a source. It's a good source of calcium, mineral, and protein as well. Have some fat in it, but you can choose low fat. The only comments that I will make about um, 
organic food is, that there is no evidence that organic food is necessary, it's costly. However, it's really uh, at this point, because we do not have an ev- any evidence, it's, it's a personal choice. It's what you choose to really do. The rest I spoke earlier. Let me continue. This is a portion amount of cheese. Look at that, just four small cubes. Uh, we usually eat, I believe, maybe five times this alone, especially in those parties with wine and cheese that we do all the time. Uh, fats and oil, I mentioned the finger dip. So this is really the amount. I hear so many people say, oh, olive oil is great. It's healthy. Yes, it's healthy, but you cannot have unlimited quantity. You have to think about the quantity that you're taking. So a little bit finger um, tips in in salads. You can put, you choose olive oil, canola oil, as you can see, fat that really reduce about uh, the uh, cholesterol, bad cholesterol, the LDL, low-density lipoprotein. In the past, there were lots of, uh, of, of knowledge and studies that saying that omega-3 have more of an anti-inflammatory and omega-6 more of pro, pro-inflammatory. Some of this is true. Some of it lately, there are some studies that said they are both important. They both really reduce the bad cholesterol. They both have some anti-inflammatory, but perhaps omega-3 has a bit more of an anti-inflammatory. So omega-3, as I mentioned, the salmon, the flaxseed oil that Amy mentioned, and uh, omega-6 is most non-flower seeds. You always can Google and find the least if you're really interested. However, if you eat sensibly, you probably include all these uh, important ingredients. This is just to illustrate the fingertips again, the small amount uh, of oil to include. And then herbs and spices and sweetener. I love the fact that many restaurants now offer honey instead of sugar for your coffee and tea and many others. So try to use natural sweeteners and and spices like uh, cinnamon, nutmeg, nutmeg, cardamom that has a minty flavor. Try to substitute some of these for salt uh, and to provide you really foam flavor. There are lots of different spices out there that you can use that have less uh, less harm. Next, I would like to spend a few uh, just a few minutes about overweight and obesity and MS. There is some data lately that uh, obesity and overweight has a, has a more inflammatory uh, uh, disease, and it's considered a disease today, obesity, and perhaps leading to systemic inflammation and may worsen or maybe trigger an MS. The only data that available that is nowadays is that uh, teenager, young, young, very young adults that are obese in the younger years have may have an uh, increased likelihood, increased risk to develop MS at some point. We don't know if this is a cause and effect. Uh, it, just an association at this point, and I'm sure we'll have many, many more studies in the future about overweight and and MS. However, it's important to control and manage your weight because of fatigue issues, because of mobility issues, and general weakness. So uh, as much as possible, need to think about uh, intake and output. Very easy to eat and, and, and increase the calories in. Much harder to burn the calories. Uh, I'm sure we all know that and, and definitely Amy and I. Uh, it's important to, to be active. It's important to exercise. I do it very often. And I think one of my favorite, actually, exercises is really is yoga. And I, I think Amy has a lot to to teach us about yoga and special position. Uh, so I'm really uh, excited to hear more about it. Amy? Yeah, thank you, Elisa. Goodness, we've talked about so many yummy different ways to prepare foods and um, ideas about how to incorporate healthy eating in our day-to-day life. But now we're going to talk a little bit about movement. In general, yoga is done on an empty stomach, but tonight we're going to talk about it afterwards. So what is yoga? Let's demystify it a little. To define yoga means to yoke or to create a union between our body and our mind. It's important to practice safe yoga. So I want, you to, I want to encourage you to talk to your teacher about anything you're experiencing with your body to avoid injury. You know, it doesn't matter if you're pregnant or you have 
MS or you've torn your ACL, they need to know about it so they can help accommodate you. Yoga is individualized, and it should be for you and what's best for your body on your yoga mat. So yoga is great exercise. It can be cardiovascular. It can be strength training, and it most obviously can be stretching. One of the earlier webinars we did, a physical therapist uh, recommended the ultimate exercise program. What we all strive to meet is you know, three days a week of cardio, three days a week of muscle training, and then daily stretching. And I think that this is one way with yoga to get that daily stretching in. Yoga is great for mood. It helps with sleep. It helps, it helps improve focus. Um, and we're going to maybe try a little bit of um, yoga tonight. So moving forward here, one second. Defining yoga terms, often when you get into a yoga classroom for the first time, there's all these different, this different language, and um, it's, it's kind of overwhelming at first. I can remember my first yoga class thinking, wow, what does all this mean, and they must be so smart. Well, some of the basics are an asana. An asana is a posture, and those are usually spoken in Sanskrit. So instead of saying chair pose or down dog, they use the Sanskrit equivalent. And another word is pranayama. Pranayama means breath work or meditation. And that's something that we all can do even if we have difficulty moving our bodies. So there's different types of yoga. Um, we talked about how in our community of MS, patients living with MS, we have a chair-based yoga, which I think is great not only for someone living with MS, but their care partner as well. Many of us sit at a desk all day long, and so chair yoga can be very, very, very important to get us um, moving our blood throughout the day. The types of yoga, though, they started in the beginning with Ashtanga and Iyengar. Ashtanga yoga is a moving practice with breath and with an awesome practice. And vinyasa, or power yoga, those are kind of more modern versions of Ashtanga yoga. Iyengar yoga um, is a static posture type of yoga, and throughout the Iyengar practice has developed Anasara, restorative, and adaptive yoga. And then finally, there's Bikram yoga or hot yoga um, that, you know, we typically don't want to recommend hot yoga for MS patients because it's Utah phenomena or um, sometimes the recurrent or resurgence of MS symptoms with the heat. So in um, these pictures, you can see um, straps or modifications on the right side. That's an example of maybe an Iyengar studio. In the bottom, the bottom middle there, there are some postures that are done that were created by Patabi Joyce with Ashtanga yoga. And in the bottom left are some of the Bikram, or actually the 26 Bikram yoga poses. So how to start. You can find your breath to start, and, in the, in, and remember that in the beginning, yoga was taught one-to-one, -one, a lot like how you've experienced physical therapy with a physical therapist. That's how yoga began. It didn't begin in a classroom setting. So everyone got a customized yoga experience. And now sometimes because we have larger classrooms, it's difficult to make sure that every participant's need is met. So again, I encourage you to be safe and listen to your body. I also encourage my, my patients and my community members living with MS to find the most experienced yoga teacher in your, in your community, just no different than you'd find a physical therapist that has a, a lot of MS experience or maybe is MS certified. It's preferable that that person also has experience with patients living with MS because MS patients are a little bit unique. So we're going to start with a yoga posture, and I'm going to ask you all to humor me for just a second, and we're going to start by, in a, if you're in a seated position, maybe find a chair in your home, or if you're sitting on your couch, move to the edge of your, your chair, and we're going to start by um, putting our feet flat on the floor. If your feet can't reach the floor, feel free to find a bolster or magazines. Phone books work really great with duct tape around them to give you some feedback. And I'd like you to sit at the end of your chair, pushing your feet away from the floor, lifting up through your torso and getting as long as you can. And if you can, if you can, if you can take your thumbs and put them up underneath your armpits and lift up, wiggling yourself from right to left to see if you can sit just a little bit straighter. 
then I'd like you to lift your shoulders up towards your ears and relax them down the back of your um, back, allowing your scapula to fall flat. We're going to start a little bit with some exercises now and then move in some black breath work or pranayama. So the first position that we just are pr- allowing our bodies to get into is a mountain pose from the chair seated position. Um, so I want you to continue to push down through your feet, lift up through your core, stretching your torso long, and we're going to first take our left two front fingers and push our chin nice and gently back and take a look with our eyes to the right and breathe. Now let's take a look forward and move our head to the left and breathe. Stretching your neck every day is really good for range of motion, and it is a modification of several different yoga poses. By making sure that your chin is tucked, we're encouraging really good posture. One of the other poses that we can do is a breath-related pose. I often say that if patients can't run, they can walk. If they can't walk, they can stretch. If they can't stretch, we can breathe. Breath work is very important, and often I find my patients, when they come into my office, they may be a little anxious, and they're maybe only breathing from the top of their chest up. Belly breathing is another yoga practice that is helpful for relaxing us and keeping us calm. So I want us to start by trying to see if we can blow up a balloon inside of our chest. I would like you to take your right hand and place it on the upper part of your chest, And then I'd like you to take um, your left hand and place it on the left side of your rib. We're going to try to first breathe into the top front part of our chest, taking a nice deep breath, moving our hand up and out. So breathe with me here. Now, can you try to take a deep breath into the left hand, pushing your ribs out? Now, I want to try to have you keep your right hand on your upper chest and your left hand on your ribs. We're going to take first a small sip of breath into the upper part of our chest. Then we're going to take a small sip of breath into the left side of our chest. And then we're going to try to breathe out the top of our head. So here we go. Small sip of breath into the front of your chest. Now into the side of your chest. And now at the top of your head. Can you see how your breath might be a little deeper than before we started to pay attention to our breath? So one of the other relaxation techniques I teach my patients and also yoga participants in our community is nasal breathing. Nasal breathing um, can be done to help with relaxation before you go to bed. Sometimes I teach my executives or my patients who might have headaches to, to do a little bit of this relaxation breathing throughout the day to keep them nice and calm. So you typically use your right hand, and I always suggest that you blow your nose first because who knows what we've um, sniffed throughout the day, and sometimes allergies can make us stuffy. So I'm going to have you take the fourth finger and the thumb, just like the green diagram shows in the middle of your computer screen. And typically, if we've got allergies or stuffy nose, if you lean to the side of where you're stuffy, you'll be better able to take a nice deep breath in. So we're going to use our right hand. We're going to tilt our head slightly to the left and take a nice deep breath in through just the left side of your nostril by slightly depressing your right nostril with your thumb. And I'm going to move forward on this slide to give you another description. So here we go. We're going to take a nice deep breath in through the left side of our nose. We're going to close off that side of your nostril and take a deep breath into the right side of your nose. Close off that nostril, tilt your head to the left and breathe out. Nice deep breath in through the left side of your nose. Close off that side of your nostril, tilt your head to the right and breathe out. As you can see, you can repeat this a total of 
10, 15 times, whatever works for you. Practice makes perfect. But this is definitely another example of yoga in terms of relaxation. Um, hopefully you remembered to sit up right in your mountain pose and we're continuing to maintain your posture by pushing your feet away from the floor. I'm going to have inside the slide presentation some nasal breathing tips. You can refer to these later. So on my next slide here, you can see lots of different yoga poses. Sometimes um, with various types of MS or um, various disabilities or challenges with our MS, these poses aren't accessible, so there's modifications. But I thought it would be a fun way for you to see what some of the Sanskrit words were for these poses. For example, camel, camel pose is ustrasana. Um, there's eagle pose. There's um, urva dhanurasana or, you know, wheel pose, which looks kind of fun, or virabhadrasana, warrior pose. I think sometimes if we could just have a little bit of a, a learner's key, it would be helpful, so you can refer to this later, too. In this slide, uh, we can see that there are some chair modifications for the basic sun salutation. I really like this because this is something I can do during my work day, or I can share with my um, patients living with MS to do even from the wheelchair. So in conclusion, there's lots of different forms of yoga available to you. I hope that you can find a class near you that has a teacher who has got some experience with MS. Otherwise, like I said earlier, Liz Franklin has some great videos on um, how to do MS-related yoga or chair-related yoga that you can do from your home. Um, I think it's really important to try to practice that stretching every single day and see what you can accomplish. Each day you'll find, as I find, we might feel just a little bit different. And yoga is a great way to connect your mind to your body to see what might be feeling different that day. So in, in, in summary, there is really no specific diet that has proven beneficial in MS. As we really all discussed today, and, and the recommendations from the Dietary Guidelines for Americans from 2010, we all really emphasize a diet comprising of nutrient-dense foods while avoiding foods that contain sugar, refined carbo carbohydrates, fats, and sodium. A plate of colorful vegetables and fruits, whole grain food instead of food made with refined carbs and boiled or roasted, lean meats will provide foods that are nutrient-dense. Another way of uh, reducing intake of empty calories, really controlling your portion sizes as we talk, and eating nutrient-dense food, dense food in, in the next meal every day, and making the right dietary choices really will help improve your health and quality of life. So uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, it. I think we, we talk about different diet choices. We talk about the different uh, families that we have to consume every day. Amy discussed yoga and many exercise and, and ways to really relax and manage your stress. So I think it all comes to really increase, improve your health, and increased quality of life. So thank you very much, and Anne. Great. Thank you so much, um, Lisa and Amy, for those great tips. And um, I loved those recipes that, that uh, you all provided and, and tips on portion sizes as well as um, the breathing exercises. So I know that I'll be taking away a lot of um, good beneficial information home with me. Um, so now it's, it's, we want to hear from you. Now is the time um, that you can ask your questions and you can chat them in through the chat feature and we'll um, have Amy and Elisa answer some of these. Um, and so the first question that we got, Elisa, was for you. Um, and mm -hmm. this person asks, I, ha I have hypoglycemia and I'm supposed to eat every two hours and have complex carbohydrates. What would you suggest? Um, this diet that she's supposed to be on gives her more fatigue on her type of MS, and so she, she's asking for um, any suggestions that you might have. Um, so very, very often the recommendation is to multiple, uh, to have multiple small uh, meals throughout the day. And uh, if you have, uh, you get into low blood sugars, which is really not good for the brain, especially with all our thinking, and this is the, the first place that sugar needs to go. So it's important for you to continue that and eat every two hours. 
Uh, I think mixture of uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables will be a, a good uh, a good choice here to bring it up a bit. Um, different uh, different fruits with different glycemic index because probably you want those that have lower a bit. So uh, look online. There is a whole list. I probably have it somewhere here on my desk. Uh, but those that have, you don't maybe want to increase the sugar too quickly. You want it to go up there. And I think at this point, if you have an issue, it's always good to speak with your uh, provider, with nurse practitioner, with a a special nutritionist, because for some reason uh, your blood sugar level goes down. But I would recommend a mixture of things, uh, maybe a midpoint of glycemic index, index not really too high. So if I... Uh, speak about maybe concretely, concretely some maybe make some smoothie of lemons and and some fruits to get it down a bit and mixed with vegetables like green vegetables uh, has some some carbs in it. Um, so again, I think it's it will be a mixture of things, but I would definitely think that you would would need to speak with uh, either your um, provider or nutritionist just to get. Uh, to look at at, uh, at the daily context and daily meals that you want to uh, make sure that your blood sugar stay at, at a certain level and it doesn't go below 60 or below that even. Okay? Great. Thank you. Um, and then, Amy, we have a que- we had a few questions um, that came in about, about this um, regarding yoga. And people are asking <clears throat> how much yoga is recommended and you know, that everyone's ability is different, but how much yoga is recommended? Is this once a week, daily? Um, what would you recommend? I love the advice. Do what you can. Um, and I also like the physical therapist uh, advice a few webinars ago that said stretch daily. It seems to make a lot of sense to me. And yoga, um, although they could be in the form of stretches as given to you by your physical therapist may still very well be created in a practice you do every single day. So whether it's on your mat or in a chair or in your bed, you still can be doing those similar stretching or yoga poses. So I think stretching daily from what I hear from the physical therapy world is the way to go and incorporating cardio and resistance training a few other times per week is important. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, another question. I, I think, Amy, this might be good for you since you had talked about the smoothies and the juicing. Um, we have two questions. One is, um, when you put fruit in the smoothie, is it okay to put the entire orange in there with the peel? Yeah, you can. Sometimes the peel makes the, the smoothie um, taste a little bitter, um, and sometimes when you put the peel in of a lemon, a lime, or a, an orange in juice, it can taste a little bit frothy, a little bit, and I won't say pulpy, but it's almost like if you were to eat an orange straight like you would an apple, it has kind of a a weird bitter taste. So often we try to just peel the outside of the orange or take some of the skin off of the the lemon or the lime when juicing or when making a smoothie. That's a good question. Great, thanks. Um, And then a question about juicing. Um, Can fiber cereal be added to juice? To the juice. Um, yeah, I saw that. Um, so I don't think you, uh, I mean, I think you can add whatever you want to juicing. I'm just not sure what that would taste like. But you know what? Food is chemistry in my book. So I say give it a try and decide for yourself if it works for you. Great. Awesome. Um, and then maybe a question for both of you. Um, we actually had two people ask this. Um, they say that uh, they're extremely underweight. So are there ex- uh, any suggestions um, on how to eat healthy to try to gain weight as opposed to losing weight? Mm-hmm. Um, I think frequent meals will be one idea. Um, eat, eat enough um, carbs, and, but not those refined sugars as I mentioned, uh, vegetables, fruits, um, lean cuts of meal. Maybe go a bit on the aisle portions and don't um, do too much of portion control because you want to gain weight. Uh, but include all the ingredients that we mentioned today, the healthy choices about lean cuts of meat, uh, vegetables, fruits, 
um, all food um, ingredients. So I would do frequent meals and put a higher portion control. Great. So, yeah, in my clinic, we usually talk a little bit about adding a, a few more fats to the day. So we'll talk about adding maybe coconut oil or making sure that the, the person is using an avocado, an entire avocado a day, but getting those healthy fats mixed in. And then just like Aliza said, making sure they're getting the right amino acid um, profiles with leucine, isoleucine, valine, um, making sure that they're getting that um, maybe once or twice a day. Sometimes we have our dietitians help our patients supplement um, with various things to get those appropriate amino acids twice a day. That's a great question. And you know what? I have actually many patients that have a hard time with MS keeping the weight on as well. And some of it's related to how they're digesting. So that may be another conversation you want to have with your healthcare team just to make sure you're absorbing the food like you're supposed to, whether it's from gastroparesis because of MS or if there's um, constipation or loose stool issues as a result of medication. So I think coming back to your healthcare team is a great idea when you're having trouble gaining weight and getting various opinions on whether or not it's the MS, the medications, or um, if it's really truly just a caloric loss. That's a good question. Excellent. Thanks, ladies. Uh, let's see here. We have time for a few more. Um, this person's question is um, in regards to fluid intake. And she says, I already have, I have the need to urinate quite frequently, including getting up several times every night. Um, I, I would be interested in juicing um, and smoothies, but do you have any suggestions on how to get fluid without increasing the urination? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what you think, Aliza, but um, we usually try to get our patients and um, community members living with MS to hydrate as early in the morning or before noon or before 3 in the afternoon as possible, drinking as much liquid in the morning so that they um, have time to urinate. You know, sometimes we have retention if we're drinking right before bed. So um, when the bladder muscles relax and you lay down, you have to go to the bathroom again. So what other tips do you have, Aliza, on um, helping so with bladder? I think, yeah, so I think this is a great tip to, to do it early in the day and stop hydration late at night. I always tell my patients that if they're home, hydrate the kidneys, you need to flush it out because especially if you have tendency to have bladder issues, not enough fluids cause sometimes uh, urinary tract infection because you don't really flush the system. So once you go out, it's a different story, so be flexible. But if you're home, I would say to drink enough fluids to really, really important to really hydrate and flush the whole system. Um, sometimes if you have too much frequency, you can speak with your team, see a urologist. It depends what the problem is. Is it just urgency or some retention and there is some overflow and you're not emptying? So there are many reasons that patients have increased uh, uh, frequency of urination. So you have to evaluate that, but do not stop drinking. It's really important to drink fluid, but identify the issue. You can manipulate it a bit. You can drink, as Amy mentioned, throughout the day and stop around five or six before you go to bed. It's dependent on the issues, but it's really important to investigate, evaluate, look at the medication you're on, see what the reasons for that frequency. It's just it's intake and output. And you, you need, when we drink, we go, we go to the bathroom. It's important not to sleep out throughout the day. I have a very good friend that say you, you, you take a straight sip of coffee all day and you drink, you drink, then you dribble all the time and go. So you drink the whole cup and then you stop for a few hours. So uh, it's really, you know, but again, evaluate and evaluate. Always you need to really check it out and see what the reason and then you think. But continue to drink. It's really important. I love it. We actually call it water pounding in our clinic where you drink 500 cc's <laughs> at a time just to get it down. So sometimes, otherwise we're sipping all day long. And you yeah. know, sometimes I'll even share with patient what it looks like to drink um, and not just take a sip. So I agree That's with you both. That's great. Yeah. 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 I know. I always have to remind myself to keep hydrated throughout the day. Um, so it's good to continuously remind ourselves that. Uh, we actually got a few questions um, 
in regards to um, more videos about chair yoga, and I know, Amy, that you had replied to everyone, uh, but I just wanted to say this again audibly on the phone. If you are interested in learning more about chair yoga, um, Liz Franklin, who's actually someone that Amy works with, um, she has a lot of great videos for beginners living with MS on yoga and chair. So I, um, I would suggest you, you know, kind of research Liz Franklin yoga and chairs on the Internet. And um, Amy, is that correct? She'll be, they'll be able to find some more videos on yes. chair yoga? Okay, perfect. Yes, she's easy to find, and she's actually updating her website. So I think it would be great. And, there's, you know, it's, yoga doesn't have to be done from the chair, but I think – Finding that adaptive yoga is key. So someone who really understands your anatomy and physiology and how to help address your specific needs living with MS. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and and for, that's, that's all the time that we have for questions right now. And um, I apologize to this. We did get quite a lot, a lot of questions, and I apologize to those that we didn't get to. But um, we do have a resource on our website. It is called Ask the Can Do Team. It's our Q&A. Um, resource on our website. So if you go to our website um, and, and look for that page, you can actually type your question in if we weren't able to get to your, your question. Um, and I will be able to um, answer your question or direct it to either Amy or Lisa or um, any one of our um, programs consultants to answer for you. So um, please, um, you know, I encourage you to visit that, that page and, and type in your questions. Um, we also do have a few other Can Do MS resources. We have our Can Do Library, which is a, a library of articles written by our programs consultants on all different types of topics. They're fairly short and easy to read, so you know, I, I encourage everyone to visit our website. We also have our e-news, which is our monthly um, news article that we send to um, all of our past program participants, and it just gives you an update on, you know, what we're doing um, for programs and what programs are coming out, if we're coming close to you, what topics we'll be doing for webinars. So again, um, keep in touch with us and, um, and keep up to date with um, what we have to offer for you. And before I announce our uh, next month's webinar, I did just want to say that today is Colorado Gives Day. Can Do MS is located in Avon, Colorado. And um, co what we do here in Colorado is we designate one day a year that is dedicated to a statewide movement to celebrate and increase philanthropy in Colorado through online giving. Um, so you know, if, if you're interested in supporting Can Do MS, please feel free to visit the website at www.coloradogives.com. Dot org backslash MS can do and you can donate to help support our programs that we bring to um, to our communities for free um, but we're really excited to um, be a part of this initiative um, for Colorado and in January uh, we have a webinar um, that is titled get motivated to get organized so it's kind of our New Year title to our New Year topic to, to get everyone motivated to kind of straighten out their closets or straighten out their lives to um, get ready for the new year. Um, the program will be on January 13th at the same time at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Time, and our presenters are Julianne hansen Ladev, who is an occupational therapist, and Dr. David Rintel, who is a clinical psychologist. Uh, so please remember to register for this and join us from the convenience of your home or office at no charge to you. And for everyone that's participating live tonight, you will receive um, a survey that appears on your computer screen after this webinar. Please take a moment to uh, complete that survey and share your input, your feedback. Um, we do read your feedback, and, and we try to improve on our programs and our webinars based on, um, based on your needs. And also, um, I received a lot of questions through chat if we would get a copy of this, uh, the slides from tonight with all the recipes. And yes, everyone will receive by email this evening a copy of those slides. If you do not receive them, please contact me directly by email email. Um, you can find my email address um, from, your e from your webinar confirmations, and I can send them to you directly. So I appreciate everyone um, joining us. And Amy and Elisa, I appreciate both of you for, for providing so much input um, and, and giving us all those great tips on how to stay, stay healthy and, and how to exercise. So I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks.